Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Ankeny Christian Church. Uh, please uh, join us in uh, singing our uh, first hymn, which is, a, is an oldie but a goodie, uh, Great is Thy Faithfulness. If you need it, it's a, a number 86 in your, few by, or in your uh, hymnal. Excuse me. Good morning, Ankeny Christian Church. It is so good to have all of you here with us this morning. So good to have you joining us online on YouTube and Facebook. We are glad you are here with us as well. Hey, tonight is kind of a big night. We're starting a whole bunch of stuff tonight. Mayhem uh, begins, and that's the, our kindergarten through fifth grade program. Uh, it begins at 5.30 this evening here at the church, back in the gym, right? Uh, in the gym. Uh, chaos begins, uh, and it's uh, grade 6 through 12. It begins tonight as well. Um, and the book study, and we'll call that destruction. So we have mayhem, chaos, and destruction. Uh, <laughs> the book study for God, Improv, and the Art of Living begins at 6.30, and I'll decide on a room at game time. So uh, I don't know whether we'll be out in the fellowship hall, because we're going to do some different things, or I may just take the tables down. Anyway, whatever. Um, so, 
be here this evening and be ready. Also, this week, choir will begin on Wednesday night. So if you want to sing in the choir, come and join us. And that will be, I believe, at 530 uh, on Wednesday evening. Um, because I, I mentioned chaos, uh, our youth group, um, they have a fall service project uh, that you can find out a little more about in the newsletter. But basically what they're doing is they're putting... Uh, together care kits to go to our college students and so uh, there's a whole list of items that they want for that and there'll be a way to collect those in in the upcoming weeks so uh, you might want to pay attention to that uh, there is also another book study that will be starting in about a month on October 4th on Wednesday mornings uh, contact uh, Karen Fausch if you want a book that book is called Thrive and it will be an exploration of the book of James and so uh, if you want to participate in that it will be a wonderful discussion uh, also I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the food bowl you will notice the wonderful decorations that uh, they've the, the uh, worship um, arts team has put together for the uh, for for doing the food bowl and you also notice you Iowa State fans uh, that they've got a symbol for the kicker for Iowa State that the, the ball goes through the uprights, not on the side of them. I know, I know that, I know that about 30% of the people in here are really, really happy, and 30% of the uh, people are really, really upset, and then the rest of us, you know, well, okay, whatever. It's a cheap shot, but accurate. Yeah, yeah. No comment, no comment. We'll, we'll leave it at that. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> I, <laughs> oh, I'm in trouble now, aren't I? Yeah. <laughs> Well, just uh, Iowa State, just know that you have an opportunity to win the food bowl right now, okay? So, you know, hey, uh, I also know that we're, we're like a real football game in, the, in that the, the going is slow. We do a lot of handoffs at the beginning because everybody wants to see, well, how much do I have to donate in order to put my team up on top? And so I'm sure that that total will grow. And the most important number up there, of course, is we always want to beat last year. And last year we gave a little over $1,400 to... Um, to toward uh, the cause of ending hunger in uh, the central Iowa area. Uh, the proceeds for our offering uh, for the food bowl go to uh, the Ankeny Service Center. And so um, you can participate with that. Oh, by the way, those of you who don't know, the points for every dollar that's given, um, that, that equals a point. So you can, so our, our scores are a little higher than a football game uh, at any rate. So participate in, in our food bowl. Now I want to invite you to stand. And this morning as we stand, I want you to center yourself in the presence of God. Whatever that means for you, maybe you take a deep breath and remind yourself that the Spirit of God is present and as close to you as your next breath and even the very breath that is in your lungs. Maybe for you, that's just standing firmly on the ground. Maybe you like to, to sway and move a little bit in order to center yourself. But just center yourself in the presence of the holy. God of the faithful, in every time, today you have called us together to be your church at worship, to be the one body of Christ. You have given us the gifts we need to serve you. Breathe your spirit into our worship so that each of us may take our part, that we may support each other and seek the greatest gift, love. Knead us together into one loaf with all your people throughout the world. In the steadfast love of Christ we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise God, all that is within me. Let us proclaim our trust in God who made heaven and earth. And God's faithful love stands forever. God gives justice to the poor and food to the hungry. God reigns forever.
My friends, may the peace of the risen Christ be with you and also with you. Would you share a sign of peace with those around you this morning? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I want to invite the children to come forward for a time uh, with, with, for a moment with children. looks like what the trees are going to look like very soon, you know it? They're going to turn colors, aren't they? What's my basket full of this morning? Harrison? Fruit. We have a grapefruit and a peach and a banana, strawberries and grapes, an orange and a pear and some blueberries. Why do we eat fruit? Because it's yummy, of course. Why else? Why is it healthy? What makes it healthy? That's just what you've been told, and that's what you <laughs> believe. And, and that's good enough for me, except, you know, hidden inside of each of these pieces of fruit are vitamins and minerals, and fiber. Can we see those things? No. No, but they're very good for us, aren't they? Yeah, but they're hidden. We can't see them. I want you to look out at these people out here. Do you know they have some things hidden inside of them, too? And so do you. And you haven't discovered all of those things yet, and I probably haven't all discovered all the things that are hidden inside of me yet either. But there are, there's someone out here that can make these beautiful banners that we see. She, she thinks of them in her mind, and then she sews them and makes them. There's someone out here that can take just an ordinary block of wood or... Um, um, Board, that's what the word I was thinking of, and make a beautiful piece of furniture or a bowl or a picture frame. There's someone out here that can sing really, really well. It's God. God gave them that gift, didn't they? Absolutely, you're right. Can we see those gifts when we look at the people? No, we can't. They're hidden, aren't they? Well, what if we went to the grocery store and all of us said, we only like strawberries, so we're not going to buy any of that other fruit. What would happen to the fruit in the grocery store? They would be sad. Yeah, they'd be sad. What else? What happens to bananas when you ignore them? They get rotten, don't they? They don't, they don't look very good. They don't taste. They do get squishy. What would happen if we locked the front door and said, oh, we're only going to let the people in who can sing really, really well? Yeah, that wouldn't be very nice, would it? No. We need to welcome everybody and all of their gifts that God has given them and all of you. Don't forget you have things hidden inside of you that are good for all of us and don't let those things turn rotten. Okay? Let's have a prayer. Will you repeat after me? Dear God, Dear God 
Thank you for giving us gifts. And thank you for helping us welcome everyone. Amen. Now, if you would like any of this fruit after church, come and see me, okay? All right. I'll be happy to give it to you. we remain centered in the presence of God, um, I invite us to think about those things that we're celebrating this week. Think about those things that bring us joy, like good summer fruit and, and that kind of thing. What are the things that are bringing your life joy today? Weather? Weather grandchildren? So we lift those celebrations to God, O oh God of love. Visit, visit home from, uh, from college student, oh God of love. Chaos starting. Chaos starting. Uh, the, the group, right? The youth group, yes. Some <laughs> chaos starting. Because it's been going on at our house for a long time. So we give thanks to God for youth group and, and children's program and book studies starting, oh God of love. Both daughters have new jobs. We give thanks to God for those new jobs, O oh God of love. The completion of our bathrooms, which has been an ongoing project, too, at the same time. So, well, I'll refrain from comment. But we give thanks to God for finished projects, O oh God of love. Harvest is starting, so we give thanks to God for that. We'll have a story about harvest uh, a little later in, the, in worship. But we give thanks to God that harvest is starting, O oh God of love. Yeah. Thanks to, we give thanks to God for rain in the forecast, O oh God of love. Yeah. Although those harvesters may not like it too much, but... Even as we celebrate and bring our joys before God, we also know that there are people with things that weigh heavy on their hearts and minds, and so we offer to God our concerns. And I, I ask your prayers for my family. Um, uh, there was an accident, um, and my first cousin once removed, or I don't know how to, to talk about it, my mother's cousin um, is, is, has died. And her mother, who is my oldest living relative, is now on a respirator in uh, the University of Nebraska Hospital in, in Omaha. And so I ask your prayers for them, uh, for specifically for Elizabeth and for uh, my family as uh, we will gather to uh, celebrate the life of Patsy and uh, mourn her death. O oh God of love. Are there other concerns, other things that are weighing heavy on your hearts and minds? Well, we pray for Jack and for Rose, for Jack as he, as he recovers from all these things and gets better, we hope, and uh, we're praying for Rose as she cares for him during that time, oh God of love. Yeah. Yeah, we pray for Larry and Judy, oh God of love. We do have a number of people that we are continuing to pray for on an ongoing basis, and we continue to pray for Tanya and Tommy, for Linda, for Denny, for Norma and Norma's friend Denise. We pray for Crystal, Tabitha, and Wesley, for Frank, for Jen's uncle Jake, for Jeff's mother Judy and his nephew Drew, for Nathan's mother Kathy, for Georgine's brother Ron, for Chuck, for Fran's friend Darren and her daughter Diana and her grandson Andrew, as well as her extended family. We pray for Chuck and Karen's son-in-law, Jonathan, for Larry, for Bob, 
for Laura's friend Pam and her sister, for Angela's son Jeremy, and we continue to hold in sympathy Julie and her family at the death of her son Jared, for Lexi and her family at the death of her grandfather, and Randy and his family at the death of his nephew Grant. All of these things we lift to God, knowing that God receives them in God's mercy. Faithful God, every family in heaven and on earth derives its name from you. We pray today for all parents, that they may always be aware of their responsibility to their children and live into that responsibility with love and life. May they find joy in the work and may they know your hand of peace and your presence in the moments of deep sadness. May we as your church live up to our responsibility to support parents in that work. May we find joy in supporting them and strength to sit with them in moments of sadness. We pray for parents who have seen their children destroyed by violence or poverty, that they may know comfort in their deep grief and forgiveness for this world in which such grief is a reality. We pray for children orphaned by war and poverty. May we, your church, be emboldened to work for a world where violence is spoken of as a thing of the past and food shared as abundantly as the grace we know from you. We pray for families who are homeless or separated, those who live in unhealthy or degrading or brutalizing conditions. May your church seek the justice that you call for to share our bread with the hungry poor and invite the homeless into our homes. Empower us to embrace relationships with those who struggle and those we may struggle to get close to. We know what seems impossible to us. We pray that you will accomplish in us that we may do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with you. All these things we boldly pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray for your reign of justice, peace, and life, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
When the people of God returned to Judea from exile in Babylon, there was a fervor for faithfulness, a call to revival, an attempt to get back to an authentic faith that was led by a couple of priests named Ezra and Nehemiah. Now, you might recognize those names because they're books in our Bible. And they wanted to make sure that the people of God were a people that were pure and undefiled so that God would never again send them into exile and that they would remain in God's good graces. So every day they would read aloud from the Torah, the books of Moses, out in front of all of the people. And one day they came to the part that's described in Nehemiah chapter 13 verses 1 through 3 where they read from the book of Moses that no Ammonite or Moabite should be admitted to the assembly of God because they had not offered bread or water to the people of God when they were fleeing Egypt. So when they heard that and they remembered that they weren't supposed to do that, they began to separate all of the people of foreign descent from the people of Israel. They, they sent away, they broke apart families and they, sent, they divorced spouses and sent them away so that they would be a people pure and undefiled. So, I mean, it does say in Deuteronomy 23, chapter 3, that no Ammonite or Moabite should be admitted to the assembly of God, even to the tenth generation. No one, no descendant of Ammonite or Moabite descent should ever be admitted to the assembly of God. And when they read that, they remembered it, and we remember it too. But maybe we can also remember this story about one of those Moabite people. Back in the day, when the judges ruled, that was a time when it was said of is there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Back in the day when the judges ruled, ruled there was a famine in the land, and bread was very hard to find. So a man took his wife and his two sons up from the land, uh, up from the house of bread, that is Bethlehem, to the land of those wretched people who wouldn't give us a glass of water or a crust of bread when we were fleeing Egypt. Now, the man's name was Elimelech, which means God is king. And his wife's name was Naomi, which means gentle. And his two sons were named Malon, which means sickly, an odd name to name a child. And Kilion, which means perfect or complete. And they went... To the land of Moab, those wretched people. Now, after a while, Elimelech, you remember Naomi's husband, died, leaving her alone with her two sons. And those two sons found wives from among the Moabites, and their names were Orpah, which means neck or fawn, and Ruth, which means friend. And they lived together there in the land for about 10 years, and then both of her children died. Both Malon and Kilion died, leaving her without sons or a husband. Now, Naomi heard it through the grapevine in Moab that the Lord, 
you remember, we don't say the name, but you know who I'm talking about. The great I am. The great I am had come to the aid of his people by giving them food. So she, along with her two daughters, got ready to go back. So she set out with her daughters-in-law in in tow and headed down the road toward Judah. But Naomi stopped and said to her daughters-in-law, Turn back, my daughters, and go home, back to the house of your mother. Go home. Go home. But they wept loudly and said, No, we will go. To, you, to your home with you. But Naomi replied and said, Why would you go home with me, my daughters? Do I have any sons left in my womb to be husbands for you? Go home, my daughters. For even if I were to say I have hope, even if I were to have a husband tonight, even if I were to have sons, Would you wait until they grew up? Would you wait and be unmarried until they grew up? No. No. Go home, my daughters, for it is far worse for me than it is for you because the great I am has dealt bitterly with me. And they wept all the louder. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye and went back to her people and to her gods. While Ruth clung to her mother-in-law. But Naomi said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Follow her, my daughter. But Ruth said, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, that's where I'll go. Where you live, that's where I'll live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. And where you die, that's where I'll die too. And I'll be buried there. May the great I am do thus and so to me and more as well if even death separates me from you. And when Naomi saw that her daughter-in-law was determined to go with her, she dropped the subject and they never spoke of it again. So they went along the road and toward Bethlehem, and they came to Bethlehem. And when they arrived, there was a great excitement in the town. And the women of the town said, could this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she said. Call me Mara, because the great I am has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full. But the great I am has brought me back empty. Why would you call me Naomi when the great I am has testified against me and the Almighty has judged me guilty? And that is how Naomi returned home with her with Ruth, you remember the Moabite, her daughter-in-law. And they arrived in Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. See, there's our harvest, right? The barley harvest. Now, it just so happened that Naomi had a relative of some respect on her husband's side of the family, a man, it turns out, of some worth from the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz, which means strength. And Ruth, her daughter-in-law, said to her, Let me go out to the fields and pick up the grain behind the harvesters that they leave behind. 
in, in whoever's field I may find favor. So Naomi said, go, my daughter-in-law. And Naomi, er, and Ruth went. And she went to a field and began to follow behind the harvesters and she'd pick up the grain that they left behind. By chance, she happened to be in the field of Boaz. You remember Elimelech's family member. And it just so happened that Boaz had come out from Bethlehem to the field to see what was going on in his field. And, and he, said to the, he said to the harvesters, May the great I am be with you. And they all replied, May the great I am bless you. And then he went to the supervisor and he said, Hey, who, who does that young woman over there belong to? And the, the, the overseer of the harvesters said, Well, she's the Moabite that came back with Naomi from the land of Moab, you remember. She came to me this morning and said, Please, sir, may I follow behind the harvesters and pick up any grain that they leave behind? And she's been here since this morning till now on her feet without even a rest today. So Boaz went to Ruth and said to her, Listen, daughter, don't go to any other field. In fact, don't even leave this field, but follow along. Watch where my young women go and harvest and follow along behind them. Naomi bowed her face to the ground and said to him, I mean, Ruth bowed her face to the ground and said to him, how is it that you have taken notice of me that, you have, that I have found favor in your sight, for I am an immigrant. And Boaz said to her, I have heard about all that you have done for your mother-in-law since your husband died. May the great I am bless you for all that you have done. May the great I am bless you for your faithfulness. And Ruth said to him, what did Ruth say to him? <laughs> Ruth said to him, May I continue to find favor in your sight, for you have comforted me and spoken kind words to your servant, even though I don't have the standing of one of your servants. So she stayed in the field and gleaned. Now, when it came dinner time, Boaz invited her, invited Ruth to the table along with the harvesters and said, Come, eat, a, eat some bread and, and dip your piece into this sour wine. And so Ruth came and sat down at the table with the harvesters. And, um, and he served her roasted grain. And she ate all that she could and even had some leftovers. And then she got up and went to glean. And Boaz said to his young men, don't lay a hand on her. Don't bother her. Let her even glean from the, the standing sheaves. In, in fact, if you would, when you go by the bales, take out some of the grain from the bales and leave it behind so that she can pick it up after you. And don't scold her. So Ruth gleaned all that day through the evening, and then she took what she had gleaned and threshed it on the threshing floor, and she had about 35 or 40 pounds of flour when she was done, and she picked it up and she took it back to town. And when her mother-in-law saw all that she had gleaned, she said, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who who looked upon you with favor. So Ruth told her where she had been working and with whom she had been working. And she said, the name of the man with whom I've been working is Boaz. God bless him, said Naomi. For he has not abandoned his faithfulness to the living or the dead. 
Jesus said, he even said to me, stay in my field until the harvest is finished. And Naomi said, it is good, my daughter, for you to stay in his field, for if you go to another field, you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed with Boaz's young women until the barley and the wheat harvest were finished. And she lived with her mother-in-law, Naomi. One day, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. Look, Boaz is a relative of ours, the one whose young women you've been working with. He's a relative of ours, and tonight he's going to be winnowing barley at the threshold. What, what you should do is you, could go, you should go bathe yourself. Put on some perfume, dress in your nicest clothes, and go to the threshing floor. But don't make yourself known to him until he's finished eating and drinking. Then, then, observe the place that he lies down. And go and uncover his feet and lay down there. And he will tell you what to do. So Ruth said, I will do it exactly as you tell me. So Ruth went to the threshing floor, but she didn't make herself known. She did everything the way that her mother-in-law had told her. And when Boaz had finished eating and drinking and and was in good spirits, he, he went to lie down next to the grain, at the edge of the grain. After some time, she followed him And she went over and she uncovered his feet and she lay down there. At some point in the middle of the night, the man woke with a start and noticed that there was a woman laying at his feet. And and he said, "Who, who are you? And she said, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your garment over me, for you are a relative who has the right of redemption over me. And Boaz said, may the great I am bless you, for you haven't gone after the young men, whether rich or poor. May the, this, this deed is, is even better than the first deed that you did. May the Lord bless you richly for what you have done. Now, don't worry. I will do everything for you that you have asked me to do. However, it is true that I am a redeemer, a relative who has the right of redemption, but there is a relative that is closer than me who also does. So stay here until the morning, and when it comes, if he will redeem you, then great, he'll redeem you. But if he won't, then as the, as the great I am lives, I myself will redeem you. So Ruth stayed the rest of the night, but she got up before one person could recognize another because he had said no one should know that a woman came to the threshing floor last night. And as she was leaving, Boaz said to her, hold hold out the cloak that you, give me the cloak that you were wearing, hold it out. And, and, And when she held it out, he poured six measures of barley into it, and then he left and went back to town. When she brought home what she had to her mother-in-law, her mother-in-law said, how are you? How, How did it go? And she said, she told her everything and said, he even said to me, take these six grains of barley, six measures of barley back to your mother-in-law so that you don't go back empty-handed. Sit tight, my daughter, Naomi replied, until all of this is taken care of, for I am sure that he will not let this matter settle 
he will settle this matter by the end of the day. Now, Boaz, as soon as he went to sit at the, at the gate of the city, the relative of which he spoke came passing by, and he said, friend, come over and sit down. And so he did. And then Boaz selected ten of the elders of the city and said to them, sit down here. And they did. And then he said to the relative, Naomi, who returned from the land of Moab, uh, Moab is planning to sell her par the parcel of land that belonged to our brother Elimelech. I thought I would bring this matter to your attention so that here in front of my people and the elders of my people, you might buy it from her because you have the right of first redemption. But if you won't redeem it, please let me know because I am next in line. And the man said, I will redeem it. And Boaz said, on the day that you buy the land from Naomi, you will also acquire Ruth, the widow of Malon so that you will be able to keep his name along with his inheritance. And the man said, well, then I cannot redeem it because it would damage my own estate. You redeem it. Now, back in the day in Israel, it was customary to finalize a deal of, of, of redemption or a property transaction by one man removing his shoe and giving or his sandal and giving it to the other. And so when the relative said, you redeem it, he took off his sandal. Then Boaz stood and said to those around him, he said, today you are witnesses. Today I have bought the land from Naomi that belonged to Elimelech and Malon and Kilion, and I have, also, uh, I, I have also redeemed Ruth, the wife of the dead man, so that his name will still be attached to his inheritance and his name will not disappear from his people or from the gate of his hometown. I have messed it up, so... <laughs> Then all of the people at the gate and all of the elders said, Today we are witnesses. And may the great I am bless you and give you children through this woman that has come into your house. May, may she be like Leah and Rachel who together built up the house of Israel. And may your name be famous in Israel and may you have children through this woman who is coming into your house. So Boaz took Ruth as his wife. The Moabite, you remember, took Ruth as his wife. And they were intimate together. And the Lord, the great I am, enabled her to become pregnant and she bore a son. The women of the town. I'm just going to hold on to this for the rest of the story, all right? The women said to Naomi, Praise be the great I am who has not this day left you without a redeemer. May he become famous in Israel and may he will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons, has given you a son. Naomi took the child in her arms and became his guardian. And the neighborhood women gave him a name, saying, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed, which means one who serves. 
Now, Obed, he became the father of Jesse, who became the father of none other than David. As you will remember, David became the greatest king that Israel ever knew. So it was through the faithfulness of Ruth, the Moabite. Ruth, the one from those wretched people that we are not supposed to include in our assembly. Through her, God gave the people hope. Through her, God gave, through her steadfast love and faithfulness, God gave the people a future. So before we exclude anyone from among the people of God, so before we would not welcome anyone from the, the assembly of God to the assembly of God, before we do that, we must remember that faithfulness can come from people from whom we think there is no faithfulness. And God can work out the future through anyone God chooses. All are welcome here. Let us pray. <coughs> Gracious God, we give you thanks for your faithfulness and for the faithfulness of others that live as examples to us. May we keep our eyes open and our ears aware of those around us through whom faithfulness comes even though we would not expect it. I grew up in the Waterloo Cedar Falls area and I grew up um, going to the Waterloo Central Christian Church. Uh, I did not have a lot of, uh, my grandparents were six hours away and um, 23 hours away. We didn't have very much extended family nearby. And the church became my aunts and uncles. It was very much my extended family. Uh, we moved down to Des Moines about 19, 19 years ago and I didn't realize how hard it was going to be leaving the church that became my family growing up. Um, talking with somebody that I worked with, they invited me to their church. I don't remember the denomination, and I probably said that I uh, wanted to, to find a disciples church. And 
we started talking about the differences and, and um, what the Disciples of Christ was and communion came up and I said that we do it every Sunday and everybody is invited. And they thought that that was a little strange and said, well, isn't it not as special if you do it every Sunday? And I think I had always taken for granted that doing communion is about as important as singing and the sermon. And it's just, it's a part of our worship together. And, and there's a lot of things that we do that the more often we do them still makes it special. I'm a hugger. Every hug I give is special. Hearing and receiving compliments, doesn't matter how often, it's still special every time. I can't relate to this, but I've heard of a runner's high. It's special every time. It's something I've never experienced, but <laughs> it's still, it still is special. Uh, spending a week at church camp, every night you do communion, and every night it still is special. And I know that I need, I need the reminder every week everybody is welcome. This is a time that's always there, a time to rely on, and it's, it's for everybody. We gather here and remember together that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body that's given for you. In the same way, also, after supper, he took a cup and he blessed it and gave it to them and said, This is the blood of a new covenant poured out for many. Do this as often as you drink it to remember me. Let us pray. It is indeed a right and joyous thing in all times and places to give you thanks and praise, almighty and everlasting God, for by your word you called the universe into being from nothingness. You saw us alone and declared that it was not good for us to be alone, and you gave us companions in our life's journey. Yet we turned away from those relationships and our relationship with you, treating others as disposable and alienating each other from us and from you. You never turned away from us, however. Instead, you reached out to restore our relationships. Through your prophets, you call us to care for each other, and at the right time, you even saw fit to become one of us and relate to us in flesh and blood. You have redeemed and restored our lives, and we are no longer alone. Jesus, our Redeemer and friend, calls us now to this table, and we come as we are in our relationships as they are. So pour out your spirit upon this bread and this cup that they may be to us the body and blood of Christ Jesus, and that in our sharing of them, we might be nourished as the one body of Christ, ready to serve you in the world, offering love and restoring relationship. Amen. People of God, these are God's gifts to you. Come and receive the gifts of God's grace. All are welcome here to receive God's grace.
Gracious God, you have nourished us again at this, your table of life. Send us from this table restored and ready to share your love with the world. Amen. My friends, go in peace. Go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, who is eternally one God and mother of us all. Amen. Amen.